Hello, industry people. <laughs> Thanks for saying we're back. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about uh, social video because I think it's a term that's going to come up again and again. Uh, you don't have to look at the graph right now. You can just look at me in the graph. I just literally put that up because it looks important. Um, but, but so, so I'm just kidding. That is actually important. Um, but it's a term, right? We start hearing this this term, social video, getting kicked around, and uh, the, the, I, I just want to sort of like talk about how uh, I think about it and how we think about it at the, at the studio that I've, uh, I've created um, to help you know shed a little light uh, uh, on how to take it seriously, um, because I think that the word social has has uh, almost become like one of those words you say over and over again and then it has no meaning uh, after a little while. Uh, so the, 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 the big trends, right, that, that we all know is that uh, video demographics are getting younger, right? Younger people are, are looking at stuff. And I don't know how many of you, uh, you know, geek out to uh, Nielsen rating stuff, but uh, Facebook, you know, requested that Nielsen do a study of how many viewers uh, are looking at Facebook during prime time. Right? And Facebook kicks every network's ass. Right? They just like shred. Right? And, and that's what we see a lot of. We see during prime time, mobile video usage is going through the roof. And, it, it, and what's happening is that people are sharing videos with each other during prime time. Uh, and, and that's how a lot of stuff is being spread. So the question uh, that, 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 that comes out of this is what, what does social mean in the context of video production, right? Is it, is it just like a little thing that we tack on to the marketing aspect of video? Is it really just about releasing video in the right place? You know, you understand this like big problem here, right? I mean, it, marketers treat it like that, and that's, that's certainly like the, the notion of social is that it's almost like a trick. Right? There's a trick that you can add to your stuff and then you don't have to pay as much to have it viewed because people just share it. And that's sort of the, where the conversation ends uh, to some extent. But from, for the, I'm just going to like walk it back for a second and, and, and just look at the history of media, and spe specifically linear narrative media. And I think the history of media has really been written from the, uh, the perspective of optimizing media for consumption. Right? We, we create media for consumption and we you know, really optimize around that feeling that you get when you look at media. And it's like candy. It's like the most wonderful candy in the world. Right? We, we're, we're so good at optimizing media for consumption that we walk out of movie theaters and we don't know where the hell we are. Right? We walk out and we're, you know, like the light hits you and you're like, oh, God, I really want to ride a motorcycle across Argentina. Like, and, then, and then, like, your, your, your reality starts slipping back on you and you're like, what the hell is going on? Like, um, and and so, so we're, in, we're incredible at that and we've made businesses out of it and we've measured the, the result of those businesses and we know they can drive ticket sales and people will pay for subscriptions and it is this robust way of thinking about media. Now the question is, what about social? Is that the same production model? Is that the same goals in mind? Are we just trying to make things that people love to consume and feel something very personal? Or is it actually a different type of content? And I would say that the, the, you know, the, 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 the hunch that, that I operate, it's a the conviction at this point, the conviction that I operate on is that the, the content itself is used differently. It is not consumptive. What the content is used for is as a proxy for communication, right? So we use the, the content as a way to actually communicate with people. And that's, I mean, that's not, I'm not saying anything brilliant here. That's like the, the fundament of social, and I think we've all, we've all said that before. But, you know, just to hammer it home, there are certain things that are a lot easier to say with a picture or a moving image than you can say it with text, or at least the impact is much greater. So, for me to witness something that I think is totally ridiculous, stupid, and messed up, and I can't believe it, I could type that out. This is totally ridiculous, and I can't believe it. Or I could send a picture of Captain Picard face palming, right? <laughs> Like, that expresses all of that in perfect, succinct, like, in a, in romance, I would say, right? And so the question is, like, that, that is a piece of media that was created for consumption and then repurposed for 
this proxy for conversation. And, the, and so the bigger question is, could you develop a discipline or a business around trying to create media that specifically was being used for conversation? And that's ultimately what uh, I set out to do. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how, uh, how that kind of uh, got set up uh, originally. And, and then a little bit about uh, what that means in terms of uh, how we think about and how we make, uh, make video. And right now, the studio makes about 25 videos a week. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more uh, uh, about those uh, different things. So the first thing is that, so why do people share content, right? And the clues to that are often in the share line with the content. Right? So you, you, in, in Facebook and things like that, you share the video, but you also have a little bit of space to explain why you're sharing it. And that's one of the most interesting clues uh, as, as to why this stuff comes about. And so identity becomes a big, big piece of this, right? So identity is a really great way to explain how we would think about uh, how a piece of content uh, can exist in this. Uh, so for example, thinking about how media is used for uh, conversation, there are certain things about people's identity that are really hard to say. So left-handed people don't usually have a big density of left-handed friends. There just aren't that many of them, right? So there isn't much of an opportunity to say that the entire world is optimized for right-handed people. There are a measurable amount of deaths. <laughs> no, don't mean to laugh. Um, <laughs> that's a really, really wrong time to laugh. <laughs> Um, there, there's a measurable amount of deaths uh, to left-handed people because of the right optimized world. I mean, it's like every coffee cup that they go into in any space is always turned the wrong direction. Not a cause of death. But the doors, the, the way they open, all kinds of different things, spiral notebooks, you know, like even writing pencils from left to right, they get dust all over their hands. This is like measures of identity that don't really get broadcast in any real way, right? And so, uh, you know, for example, a piece like uh, why the world sucks for left-handed people is a perfect kind of proxy for communication. They, you know, they post it and they say, finally, this is me, right? And it's those kind of share lines that are a great clue to this kind of, uh, uh, of content creation. So there's three, there's three areas that we look at. One is the content itself, two is the context, uh, and then three is the network and seeding. But, so the first thing is this production company, uh, because it is experimental, the, the idea is that there's lots and lots of these kinds of formats out there uh, that need to be discovered. And by nature, this kind of studio and this kind of enterprise, which I hope a lot of you are gonna be participating in soon, um, because it's experimental, the first thing that had to happen was that we had to cut a lot of the bureaucracy out of a production company. So at our production company, there is no division of labor, right? There are not writers, DPs, editors, directors, all that kind of stuff. I hire individuals who are good from top to bottom, who can take a concept and work it all the way through execution, right? And then they can come together in small pods and make things. But the point is that if we're talking about kind of like psychology of sharing and what, what kind of identity, you know, what kind of a piece would a narcissist want to share? You know, what kind of a, what kind of a piece would, it, would somebody who lives in Cincinnati want to share to express a part of themselves? All these kinds of concerns, like if you go through this kind of cycle, it's hard, it's hard as it is, and it's really hard to go down each single uh, step of the chain in a rewrite or an edit or anything like that. So we hire these individuals. The second thing uh, that I'm pretty passionate about is that we don't have uh, an approval process uh, from the top, right? We do approval by consensus. Um, so, so instead of having what I call a, uh, a, a Cartesian paternal system, where you imagine that there's some person who can rationalize the entire network in their mind and decide what's good from the top, making these decisions, we just allow producers to approve each other's work. So if you have minimum criteria, they get to sign off on it. And the second thing is that we don't ever pitch series. The same problem there. If you pitch a series, you're basically guessing, but you're increasing the chip value of the bet that you're making from web one episode to 13 episodes all of a sudden, or five or six or whatever, but the chip value went up. 
So what we do is we release every video that we make when we make it, and if we have a concept for a series, if anyone does, they make the episode, they publish it to the audience, we see if the audience liked it, and if they do, we'll make another one. And then after three of them in a row have some measure of success, we will commit more money, more time, potentially more labor to the process and have it actually go. And then the third thing, and this is a little, my personal, uh, having worked in this world for a long time, the third thing is that we don't have anyone in the decision-making hierarchy that makes any decisions about anything creative that doesn't make content. There's, there's, like, there's, like, there's like a few content creators with really horrible bosses that just clapped. Um, but I think that's so important because I think that we're in an area, in the last seven years, this little pocket, right, this, this younger demographic pocket of, of short, optimized for mobile content, uh, we, we are in a mobile environment, 50% of the views that we get are on mobile phones. So, you know, we're, we're experimenting with shorter content, content that doesn't rely always on audio. Uh, doesn't, you know, we, there's things that you can just watch uh, instead of having to listen to. And <clears throat> so in that sphere, there's just, there's tons and tons of work to do. There's so few formats have been developed in that space in the last seven years. I mean, you would sort of think that the video blog itself was the pure and optimal solution to this uh, chunk of time. And I don't think it is. I think that we have a lot more work to do in that space, uh, a lot more really interesting uh, work to do in that space. So I'm just gonna click through a couple of these slides, and pardon me for uh, being a little bit... Uh, uh, so this is, this is sort of the fundament of any... Uh, and somebody's just gonna have to kick my ass off stage because I, I, mean, I could just ramble on forever here. But nobody... <laughs> so this is the fundament to all, uh, you know, when you think about social video, really what you're trying to optimize is the number of people that share your content. And what I love about this model is that things like SEO gaming, like click gaming, all that kind of stuff where you can increase the number of clicks or individual views, don't work here. Because you not only have to have that, but you have to have people follow it on with an actual share, right? So there's something that I love about this model just almost from an ethical standpoint, where what you do in this, and the blue represents what, what, what we call seed, so the seed would be the initial uh, you know, group of people that you show the video to, whether it's the, the front page of BuzzFeed, it's also seed includes all the YouTube promotion, all the algorithmic promotion, all that stuff would be considered seed, because it's not generated by a human sharing with another human. And then we look at the red portion, which is the additional traffic that you get by sharing. And the amazing thing about this is that tiny changes in the way that you formulate the content or uh, you know, uh, express the framing can make a huge difference on the amount of sharing. Right? All you need is a tiny little thing. There's this, so the New York Times had, had this one article that shared more than any other article. It was, <laughs> It was, how training a killer whale is like training your husband. <laughs> and I love this, right? Because it was a really interesting article about training killer whales, but it also like showed that there are some similarities. And it, it's such a great way of pointing out a number of different features of highly shareable content. One is the content was pretty darn good. Number two, the, the, you know, it, it involves things like anthropomorphism. We love like talking about difficult things in humans by projecting them onto animals. We just sort of love doing that. That's why we love kittens and, and cute kittens and memes about kittens and things like that. It's ultimately social. So that's ultimately, ultimately about people. But the amazing thing about that title is that it tells you who to share it with. You share it with people with husbands, or you share it with husbands, or you people you know share it with people who used to have husbands, right? It's it is it, it's that's the context layer, right? There's the content layer, and then there's the context, how you present it, and how you position it so that so that uh, people understand. So this relationship and constantly monitoring this relationship between the people you initially present it to and the people who end up watching it. That's the core on the analytics statistics side of, of this kind of pursuit. Um, I'm going to just uh, skip here. So when you think about, you know, like, even in the world of YouTube, I think you can start to think 
that you are participating in a very traditional sort of uh, model of capturing uh, a large group of subscribers and then you're publishing to that subscriber base. But for a lot of channels, not all of them, but I would say more than less, uh, the number of subscribers that actually watch your content in a month is a very small percentage, sub 10%. So the people that are actually responsible for that growth are in due to, you know, are, are due to sharing, due to the YouTube algorithm, due to other kinds of promotion. So it's, it's not really the business that you think that you're in anyways. And so the, you know, the question is, do you start thinking about whether your stuff is sharing and what the, those mechanics are? And we certainly do. So what we do is we try to think about the different sort of uh, video frames is the wrong word, I would say video formats. So general formats that start capturing some of these different facets of why people share things. Um, and in some cases, to be honest with you, we have absolutely no idea why they share. Right? So people love facts. We're trying internally to come up with some system of understanding why people share facts so much. They don't just consume them, they share them. So one, you know, one idea is, of course, that, that you're trying to share the information benevolently, benevolently with friends of yours, which is probably not right. There's something closer to the humble brag that starts happening quite a bit, right? In the share statements surrounding a lot of the facts pieces, we pick up lots and lots of anecdotal data of people saying, I got eight of these, right? That's a humble brag, right? And it's greatly positioned because they usually never say they got all of them. That's the perfect humble brag. It's like, I'm awesome, but not completely awesome, right? <laughs> Um, the true facts series, I mean, I can sort of talk about these uh, as, as they go, but this is, this is kind of the monitoring that happens. There was a big, uh, a wonderful release called How to Piss Off Every New Yorker in 36 Seconds. Um, it, it, it did very well. I think it's uh, close to the six million range or so. But the idea here was, this was, you know, everything comes out of a thought process. And this one came out of, what is an identity piece about location? That was the first. What is an, a location identity piece about New York? So what does it mean to be a New Yorker? And then the next layer on top of that was, how do you not only activate New Yorkers, which is a sizable audience if you can get a lot of New Yorkers to, to watch something, but how do you also make a piece, not just for New Yorkers, but for everyone who's ever been to New York or has an opinion about New York? And so this piece really was, <laughs> not only expressed uh, what it feels like to be a fish out of water, but, you know, in this case, uh, it's upstreaming a cab. So this is, this is a guy who's hailing a cab, and then Henry Goldman, who's in these videos, steps right in front of him and hails the cab, right? Upstreaming a cab. Or he just stood in the, in the, uh, the, the subway area and swiped his Metro card over and over and over again <laughs> because he didn't get it to work and all these different things. But it kind of talks about New Yorkers, too, and their reaction to these kinds of moments, like standing in the bike lane. Someone's going to call you an asshole. It's just the way it works, pardon my language. <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is that videos share differently in different platforms. And content generally shares differently in different platforms. Facebook, for example, Nothing where you swear a lot will share in, uh, across big, big swaths. I mean, you know, once in a while, but people tend not to share things where there's, you know, a lot of uh, unsavory kind of language and, and, and themes. It's a little more like the suburbs, right? Twitter tends to share more intellectual. It, it tends to do topicality-based uh, stuff. So the point here is that sharing within networks the, the, the thinking doesn't really just stop at YouTube. It really, it, it, it just starts there, and then it moves off into all these different places where you have to try to figure out, like, you know, how do you get video to share on Tumblr? It's a completely different environment with completely different context and completely different uh, framings. So these are the kinds of videos that come out uh, of the studio, and you can, uh, these are three of the main channels, BuzzFeed Video, BuzzFeed Yellow, and Zayfrank One. 
and you'll see that there's a big variety of, uh, uh, of content types. And this is another thing that comes out of sharing focus, is that you start moving away from vertical categorization. You start saying, like, people, when they share things, if we're participating in their conversation, uh, Jonah Peretti, who's the, the, the founder of the company, likes to say that it's sort of like being in a Parisian cafe, right? You go there to be intellectual, right? You go there to read your philosophy, but when a cute dog comes in, you stop and pet the dog, and you start talking about dogs for a little while. And maybe there's a, a cute person a little uh, close by, you flirt with them for a second, right? This is life. This is the expression of life. So these channels are very multifaceted and we're resisting the temptation to verticalize uh, 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 very early. Um, how am I on time? Another 15 minutes. Okay. No, 45 minutes. No. no. Anyways, uh, I, I'm going to be around later. I'd love to talk to you guys about this. Uh, I think it's super exciting, and uh, I hope to have a lot more of you think about this problem with me in the future. Thank you so much.